Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, that was a hearty good morning from uh, those gathered here today. That's great. I guess everybody's excited about the eclipse. What eclipse? Uh, thank you, thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Do we get, ever get the glasses? Yes, does everyone have their eclipse? I actually will be in Indianapolis tomorrow. Oh. Oh. So, uh, thank you. <laughs> Whatever that means, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, but it's interesting, and I am not at all making light of this, but yesterday in the mail, I received a letter that did not have a return address on it. I received a letter saying, Dear Pastor, it was actually neatly typed out, so it was a form letter. Dear Pastor, make sure you tell your congregation on Sunday that the world is ending on Monday. <laughs> so um, now I have now, we know in scripture, what did Jesus say? No one knows the time, nor the hour, nor the day. So we really want to go by what Jesus says, not by some unsigned letter. Um, so as far as I know, the world is not going to end, okay? However, there appear to be some folks in the congregation who believe the world is going to end. And here's how I know that. No one has signed up for anything for the rest of the year. So, now, let me tell you, okay? If the world ends, okay, and life as we know it no longer exists and you're all taken into heavenly bliss, you don't have to do family and friends night, okay? But let's operate on the premise that the world is not going to end. And I was, I have to admit, I was somewhat saddened yesterday because Donna called me and said, you know, no one has signed up to be communion. And of course, uh, we have virtually no one signed up to do much of anything from now up through next year. Now, I'm not being, I'm not angry, uh, but I am concerned. And so I'm going to ask everyone here to please prayerfully consider what you can do. I mean, we have so many opportunities in this church. So many opportunities. I mean, to be a to be a liturgist, and if you wonder what that's like, speak with Cheryl or with Penny or any of our folks who serve as liturgists. It's a wonderful ministry. And you can see, look how happy Cheryl is. Oh, yes. <laughs> she's, just, she's beaming with joy, okay? And seriously, all of us have a role. All of us have a role in this church. And please, prayerfully consider, and, and these are the opportunities. I know I'm getting a little ahead of the announcements, but these are the opportunities. First of all, to be a communion, to be our communion servers, communion stewards, uh, making sure communion is prepared and uh, making sure that, that we have the elements here on Sunday morning. And it's a... Uh, that's something we do the first Sunday of each and every day. <coughs> so think about that. Also, our host, hostess for our, our social hour after the service. That's, uh, you know, that's very important. That's a part of who we are. That's a part of what makes us the church that we are. That time of fellowship and friendship. Um, we also, of course, have family and friends night. And I know we are not a large congregation. But certainly, we can all step up and sign up. I will sign up for something or other, uh, including being your pastor. But the reality is that it's important. And I want us to simply remember one thing, and that is we are in our 180th year. And the reason we are in our 180th year is not because of any particular pastor. And it's not because of any particular outside influence on this congregation, it's because over the years, and many of your relatives in, uh, were involved in this, people stepped up to make the congregation live, and we need that now. So, so again, please pray about it. Let's get those sheets filled up within the next few weeks, and uh, I think you will find any kind of ministry in this church is very, is very rewarding. So, today we're going to talk about the hardest part of being a Christian, and that's what happens on the Monday after Easter. You know what, the, our sermon series this month during the Easter season is called Monday is Here. And you know, it's great on Easter Sunday, and I do want to take a moment just to thank everyone for being part of our Easter services, our sunrise service, our, our service at 9 a.m. It's just a great joy to see all of you, to spend Easter with you, to have time after the service to celebrate 
Reality is now it's Monday. Well, actually it's Sunday, but it's Monday in our lives because Monday's coming, you know? And we have to go back to our normal life. And our normal life with the question, what does the resurrection mean? And how hard is it to believe that, that, that God raised Jesus from the dead? He didn't just bring him back to life. He didn't resuscitate him. He resurrected him. And so to, in, the, in the gospel that Cheryl is going to read today, we're going to see how Peter reacted to that the third time he sees Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. The third time, he had G, uh, Peter has not seen Jesus two times, and so what does he do, as you're going to hear in the gospel? He goes fishing. And sometimes that's, I think that's our reaction that Christ the Lord is risen today, but the next day, life goes back to normal. And that's the great challenge of Christianity. So that will be our message today. But before we do anything, let us start with this powerful affirmation. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let, let us rejoice and be glad in it. Now, first of all, for announcements, uh, Penny has an announcement regarding church council. On the back table are, uh, is a paper that tells you who the board members are um, and what their functions are on the board. So if you're unclear who your board members are, grab one of those papers. Thank you. And Cheryl, tomorrow, where are we all going to be tomorrow at 5 o'clock? Well, hopefully at Bill's Friends Hope Very Center. Very good. <laughs> you want to give us a little update on things? Sure. We're obviously scheduled tomorrow from 5 to 6.30 at the Phil's Friends Hope Center. Everybody is welcome. I'd love to have all of you. Um, as I said a couple Sundays ago, there's so many different ways to help uh, tomorrow night so we can find something for everybody. Um, I have addresses if anybody needs it. I have waivers. They just want you to sign a piece of paper that you know you won't, that you accept all liability. Um, nothing major, but if you have any questions, please see me. Very good. Five o'clock, and what's the address? 1249 Arrowhead Court in Crown Point. That's off Summit? I, I, I don't know. It's a little north of there. Okay. All right, 1249 Arrowhead Court. If anybody needs a ride, please let me know. Very good. Let's have a great turnout for that. Tremendous, uh, I think it's a tremendous program. Exciting, very exciting program. Are there other announcements this morning? All right, there being none, let's spend a moment and greet one another with the love and the peace of Christ made so real on Easter morning. All right. Oh, yeah. As emotions are running so high, let us now be about the reason we've gathered as we join in our call to worship. Please stand if you're able for our call to worship. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With the Lord at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Please join us in our opening hymn, Trust and Obey, page 467. And there will be verses 1, 2, and 3, and there will be an introduction. Trust and obey. Trust and obey. 
testify to how God works in each of our lives, and we know that God is present every moment of our life. There's never a moment that God is not present to us in ways more intimate than any human relationship could possibly be. But there are certain times, and perhaps those are our most vulnerable times, that we feel God most clearly and hear God with most clarity. And so we testify to that, not simply to say that God's done something for me that God hasn't done for you, but to say that I felt God's presence. And I know it was God in my life who rolled away whatever stone was blocking the tomb I had myself in. That's the beauty of joys and concerns. And today we're gonna to start with just two very special things. First of all, our sanctuary light. And today that sanctuary light is in honor of Johanna Williams and David Williams, uh, two people who are very instrumental in the life of this church and in the life of this area. We thank you for the light of their lives. As you know, David was very much involved in a number of things, but particularly in the cemetery, Salem Cemetery that shares the same age as Salem Church, interestingly enough. And again, his work there and his work in other things, his involvement were, was very instrumental and integral to, to who we are today. And of course, what can one say about Johanna? Uh, she was an inspiration. Uh, I often said, and I said this at her memorial, when you are pastor of Salem United Methodist Church, you get advice from two people, God and Johanna Williams, and often not in that order. <laughs> but the reality is, she's a wonderful, wonderful soul who touched us all very deeply. And so as we look at this light today for Johanna and for David, I think they each represent in so many ways what makes this church what it is today. For David, it was the idea of how we serve and how we work and how we invest our talents and our labors in building God's kingdom. Whether those labors are working in a cemetery, making sure it is an appropriate place of rest for those who have gone, or assisting in any other way, that's the light that represents service. In Johanna's case, it is a light that I think represents faith. I know even in those darkest moments, whenever you would call her on the telephone, and anyone who's called her on the telephone knows this, she always sounded like she didn't have a care in the world. There was always a laugh in her voice. There was always um, a, a sense that everything was going to be okay. And now for both Johanna and David, everything is okay. But we celebrate their lives, and we thank them, and you know what? We thank God for sharing them with us. So let us always let their lights burn in the light of this church and in our individual hearts. Also today, I am very pleased, and this is so appropriate, as we celebrate 180 years as a congregation. We are one of the oldest congregations in the entire Indiana conference. Okay. And that is amazing. Do you know how many congregations close each and every year? Do you know how many congregations closed because of the Great Depression? Do you know how many congregations closed because of World War II? Do you know how many congregations closed because of COVID and never reopened? And we're still here. And I want to say a special thank you to John and Elaine for preparing this plaque, having this, having this made. 
This plaque contains the names of individuals who contributed to the windows in the old church. And it's going to be placed here in this church as sign and symbol of one reality, that the power of God is best realized through the faithfulness of people. And as you know, each window in that church, each window in that church had a plaque under it designating the sponsor or the benefactor of that window. And if you walk in the old church, which I've done on many occasions, you can see that it tells a great story. Those windows tell the story of who Jesus was and how Jesus touched us and how God's miracles have worked in human, in human community. And I want everyone today, I'm actually going to place this uh, over on one of the tables. And please take a moment and stop and look at these names and reflect on them about what they mean. And at this point, I think it is important that we do have a blessing of this plaque, not as a, not simply as a plaque or something to put on a wall, but whenever we ask for God's blessing on a material object, we are asking for God's spirit to cause us to look to this as a, as a point of respect, as sign and symbol of the power of individuals within a community. So let us pray. Holy God of abundant mercy, we pray by the power of your spirit that this plaque may be far more than a piece of history, but it may be sign and symbol of the power and the strength and the purpose of a faith community. We pray that this plaque may stand to us as representative of what has allowed this congregation to carry forward your message of hope, of reconciliation, of love for 180 years. May the names on this plaque be remembered as those who built this congregation, as those who built this congregation in service to the gospel story. We thank you for each family named here and for all the families who have called sale of their church home over this year. As we dedicate this plaque, may we dedicate ourselves by the power of your Holy Spirit to the work, the task, and the labors of building your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, thank you all very much for that, and thank you again, John Lane. And even though many of the people named here are now in the light and love of our Heavenly Father, we thank them as well for these contributions. And please stop and, and please, please stop and uh, look at those names and recall those names. I know many of you know everyone on that on that list. Great folks, great project. All right, some things today. First of all, I know many of you have asked me about Lloyd Jackson. Lloyd was hospitalized, as you know. He sent out a prayer request. He was dealing with some blood pressure issues, which is uh, good news. It was not something more serious than that. Peggy is with him in the hospital today. Uh, we hope that he will be released, hopefully today or tomorrow. Uh, we want to keep Lloyd and Peggy in our prayers. Uh, also, I heard from Karen Chopla yesterday. She took a fall and has a fractured ankle. Uh, so we want to keep Karen and Stan in our prayers. That's, that's certainly not something she needed at this time. Also, Lloyd, is, his surgery is upcoming. What day is that, Jean? Uh, the 9th. The 9th, okay. So we want to pray, pray for Lloyd as well. Also, we have some birthdays this week. Ed Atkinson has his birthday on the 10th. That was overwhelming, eh? <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we celebrate your birthday, my friend. Thank you. You're very welcome. <laughs> I was just close to a standing ovation. Why didn't <laughs> Also, our dear friend Holly, Holly Russell. Uh, Holly is dealing with multiple medical problems. And we just want to pray for Holly in, in every way possible. I'm going to reach out to her this week. Uh, and just let her know she's still very much part of our family. And also, Marilyn Virtue. Uh, Jim and Marilyn. Marilyn has a birthday on the 11th coming up this, this week. Uh, so we want to keep all of our birthday folks in our prayers and just thanksgiving that God gives us that gift of life. Other joys or concerns this morning? Yes. Yes, I'm about to. I'm about to. 
On her birthday. Nice. Yes, her birthday is the Tuesday. Tuesday, that's right. Okay, I keep forgetting Johanna's birthday, but her Sorry. birthday is Tuesday. And because of that, at one o'clock, we are going to be doing the burial for both Johanna and Carolyn uh, at Salem Cemetery. Uh, they will be together, and that will be at one o'clock, and all are invited and welcome to attend. Uh, again, celebrating life, celebrating the reality that life never ends. And it's interesting because it is Johanna's birthday on Tuesday. And we will, uh, we will certainly gather to recall a wonderful life, two wonderful lives, and to, to celebrate the fact that life has not ended, only changed. Anyone else? Yes, Laura. Um, we're going to celebrate our 36th anniversary tomorrow. Well, Ooh. great. That's awesome. And we're celebrating by, I'm going to Phil's friends. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I think, what's the perfect anniversary party? And he's probably like, bye. Bye. <laughs> yes, that's what happens at 36 years. Yeah, don't Tony, let, Tony don't let the door hit you in the pub. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, well, that'll be great. And I think Phil's Friends is a wonderful place to spend your wedding anniversary. <laughs> Absolutely. Anyone else this morning? Uh, yes, Tom. I just want to, we just celebrated our 55th wedding anniversary Friday. Oh, congrats. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Wow. That's great. She's still with me. All right. Uh, <laughs> no question about that, Tom. No question about that. Adam. Adam. Adam, yes. Uh, this is something very good. I heard Cheryl was a monster in that service, and everything went fine. We're not supposed to discuss it, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> I believe Adam, those records are sealed, buddy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You did it, Thank you. All right. Yes. Um, I'm having surgery tomorrow in Chicago, oh. and also my cousin's wife um, is having brain surgery in Chicago tomorrow. Oh, wow. Yeah. And what is her name? Marina Guernsey. Marina? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, we'll certainly be in prayer. Absolutely. Anyone else this morning? Very good. Yes, Joe. Uh, today's the day when my friend Donna passed. Oh, I'm very sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, very sorry for your loss. We, uh, it, it was one of those deals where she was suffering for years. And, right. So, yeah. She's, she's but again, we know she's at risk. Yeah. We know that. Right. Thank you for sharing that, Joe. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. All right, let us center ourselves in the presence of a, a, a loving God who knows every tear we shed, every joy we feel, every doubt we have, and every moment of our life when we question which way to turn. Holy and loving God, we come to you today and we lift unto you the prayers, the thoughts, the concerns of this congregation. We thank you for sharing Johanna and David with us as we remember their lives of light and their lives of service, we, we rejoice now that they are with you in eternal peace. And as we celebrate their birthdays, may we know their true birthday is with you. We pray that their example may, may burn strong in the light of our lives and the light of our hearts. We pray in remembrance of Donna and, and we, we thank you for her life and we thank you for the way in which, which she and Joe revealed your love and the love for one another and the love for their family. May all who continue to grieve be comforted by legacies of life who as well amid human struggle and may find great hope in the power of Easter dawn. We pray in thanksgiving for the birthdays we celebrate. Uh, we, we celebrate again for Ed, Johanna, for, uh, we, we celebrate again for Ed, for Johanna, for Marilyn Virtue, for Holly. <coughs> We thank you for the gift of life that you have bestowed upon all people. We thank you for how in each human life your compassion is revealed, your love is reflected. 
We pray for Mary as she prepares to undergo surgery. May your hand be upon her, comforting her, guiding her, strengthening her, giving her hope and giving her peace and giving her, giving her strength. We pray for Marina as she undergoes surgery, that her caregivers may be guided by your wisdom of healing and your wisdom of wholeness, comforting, them, comforting her, granting her peace. We pray for Lloyd as he prepares for surgery, to know that your strength is his strength, your hope is, is his hope, and may we feel to his caregivers and family the compassion you reveal in your son. We pray for those celebrating wedding anniversaries, for Tony and Laura as they celebrate 36 years together. <coughs> we pray for Tom and Janet as they celebrate 55 years together. We thank you for the way in which marriage shows your love for your people your love for your church. We pray today for Lloyd Jackson for his healing and strength. We pray your hand is upon Lloyd and Peggy as they walk through this journey of suffering. <coughs> Comfort them and guide them. We pray for Karen Chapla that she may feel your restorative power. We pray that Karen and Stan may know your presence in ways that heal, in ways that comfort, in ways that guide. We pray in great gratitude for the names on this plaque that we blessed and called your blessing upon this morning. May their example, may their legacy stand as testament to the strength that keeps this church going, the strength that has allowed us to serve for 180 years of gospel-inspired witness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <coughs> Please join me in our prayer of confession. Holy God, in your abundant mercy and grace-inspired love, you guide us to live as people of new creation and new life, to understand community as the revelation of your love, to follow your Son as Lord in the work of witnessing your kingdom. Yet we often turn from your wisdom. We seek pathways that serve only to bring momentary contentment, but fail to honor your call on each of our hearts. You are a God of forgiveness and reconciliation. In your mercy, forgive us for failing to open our hearts and our lives to your voice. Renew us to live as Easter people so that the world may awaken to the promise of the empty tomb. In Jesus' name, amen. We now enter into a time of silent prayer. A time actually of stillness, when we are called to still our hearts and our minds and our souls before our God. And today, I want us to simply, I want us to simply put one word on our hearts. And that word is resurrection. Don't think about what it means. Don't, don't repeat what you've heard a pastor say about resurrection. Think about resurrection in your own life. That's all I ask you to do. Put that word on your heart and allow God to speak into your life what resurrection means to you today. Amen. Amen. We now enter into prayers of the people. And as we say each and every week, that is when we really are reminded of who we are as the body of Christ. We are reminded that we have a mission, a very specific mission, and it is not simply to, to listen to words spoken by a pastor. It's not simply to say we are faithful people. It is to live the reality of people of the resurrection. Please respond here in prayer. 
Holy God of abundant grace, we pray for the church of your Son to continue to be a light that will not be dim, a voice that will not be silenced, a hope that cannot be still, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For Salem United Methodist Church and our 180th year of gospel-inspired witness to continue to be a place of fellowship, a place of service with love, and a place of mission, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For victims of random <coughs> violence, injustice, hate-fueled action, divisiveness, that the Church of your Son may be a source of hope, an advocate for justice, and an advocate for peace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear, hear our prayers. prayers. For those who are victims by war, <coughs> to know that the power of your hand is bringing acts of compassion, calls for peace, and calls to love, calls for equity among all people. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. prayers. And for those prayers residing only in the silence of our hearts and minds and the depths of our soul, where there is despair, grant hope, where there is suffering, healing, where there is doubt, peace. Lord, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. prayers. And we lift all of these prayers to you. In the name of the one who makes all things perfect, our Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 We bring forward our gifts. <coughs> Please stand for the doxology. was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please stand if you're able for this morning's gospel reading. This morning's gospel comes from the gospel of John, <coughs> chapter 21, verses 9 through 16. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, 
Do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. You may be seated. Once again, I want to thank everyone for participating in our Easter services. You know, last week I had my spices with me. Now, in response to many questions, those are not the spices involved in the turkey explosion of 2022. Uh, those are totally different spices. So, the reality of it is, though, I brought those spices to make a really important point. The point is that we simply do not understand Easter. We don't understand Easter, and I include myself in that category, because we have a hard time getting our arms around this idea of resurrection. We have a hard time getting our arms around what it means that Jesus was dead and now he's alive. He was dead and now he's alive, and he's still carrying the wounds, though. He's still carrying the wounds. He's still carrying his human wounds, his human suffering even though he has been raised from the dead. And we can sit and say in every Easter hymn ever written, Christ the Lord is risen today. He is risen. Yes, indeed, he is risen. And that's wonderful. And that's true. We know that. We know that's true because if Jesus had not ridden, risen, his followers would have been like the followers of a number of other people at that time going around saying that they were the Messiah. And often those same individuals ran afoul of the state, were tried and executed as an enemy of the state. But somehow, somehow from whatever happened on that Easter morning, out of that grew a community of faith. And out of that community of faith grew the very nature of Christianity. And there's no, there's no explanation for it. There is no human explanation for it. If the leader of a group, and this was not a large group, gathered at that cross, if the leader of a group died, his followers would run. And even though Jesus' followers didn't do that, they weren't there. Peter denies it three times. Somehow, in some way, a Christian community was born. And there is no human explanation for that. Think about that. How could a group of very non-influential people, a group of, very, of people who were considered the margins of society, become a huge worldwide religion? That is only by God's grace, and that is only by the miracle of the resurrection. But now today in the gospel, we see a person who was with Jesus a person who Jesus saw as a leader of that group, Simon Peter. A person who Jesus trusted. A person who Jesus saw as, saw as someone who was going to carry forward this message. But yet a person who denied Jesus three times. And now you know that Simon Peter has already seen the resurrected Christ twice. Remember when they are still first day, they're locked in the room, and Jesus appears among them, saying, Peace be with you, the time that Thomas is not there. And then eight days later, once again, they're still locked in a room for fear of the authorities. Jesus appears. That's this famous scene, Thomas, put your hand on my wounds. See the, see the, see the wound in my side. So Peter has seen the resurrected Christ twice. And so what does he do? He goes fishing. Think about that. Now, wouldn't you think that somehow that resurrection would have changed his mind? That somehow that resurrection would have made the whole world different? That somehow he would not have gone back to what he was doing before? That somehow he would not have gone back to, to being a fisherman? But that is exactly what happened in the Gospel that Cheryl read. Peter invites six of his colleagues to go fishing. That's the beginning of this story. Now all of them have seen the resurrected Christ. 
All of them know what had happened, but this is the reality. The reality is Monday had arrived. Easter Sunday is over. Monday is here. And the world remained pretty much the same. The Romans still occupied the holy city. The Israelites were still under foreign domination. There was exploitation among the people. The rich were getting richer and the poor were getting poorer. The widows and orphans had to fend for themselves. They had no real choice. Because it was Monday. <clears throat> All the joy of Easter and we've won. The victory has been held. Victory in Jesus. I heard that old, old story. We celebrate victory in Jesus. But then Monday's coming. And what does it mean? What does it mean? Well, the very first thing we see that it means is played out in today's gospel. Because Jesus takes Peter aside and he says, do you love me? Now remember, Peter denied Jesus three times. So Jesus takes Peter aside and he says, do you love me the first time? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. And then Jesus says, feed my lambs. Then Jesus says it the second time, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you more than these. Jesus says, take care of my sheep. Then a third time, Peter says, Jesus says to Peter, do you love me? He says, yes, Lord, I love you. Then Jesus said, feed my lambs. Now what sometimes we miss in that text is that different words for love are being used in the Greek. The word agape love, which means unconditional, faithful, totally devoted love, is used by Jesus. Peter doesn't respond that way. He uses the word and quoted the word phylos, which is friendship. Do you see, Jesus is saying, Peter, are you giving your life to me? Are you de dedicating your life to me? And, and, and Peter is saying, well, I like you. I'm your friend, but am I dedicating my life to you? I don't know if I'm ready. And isn't it interesting that Jesus asked him this three times? He asked him this three times because why? Peter denied him three times. And I think the moral of this story is pretty clear. The moral of this story is, remember, even after Jesus has to ask Peter, ask Peter three times, do you love me? Peter finally says, uses the word agape love the last time. What does Jesus say then? Feed my, feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. What Jesus is saying is, here is your commission. You denied me. You betrayed me. You walked away from me. You said you would never leave me, and yet on the very day of my crucifixion, you weren't there. And when they ask, when they ask, do you know Jesus of Nazareth? Do you know the one they call the Messiah? You refuse to even acknowledge you knew me. But yet, Jesus has forgiven him. Not only has he forgiven him, but he has commissioned him to go forward. Feed my lambs. Take care of my sheep. That is the great commission. And what does that say to us? It says to us that yes, when Monday gets here, it's hard to see the relationship between that resurrection and the world we live in. It's hard to see that relationship. But when Monday gets here, no matter where we have been before, no matter how hard it is for us to understand and accept and experience the resurrection, Jesus says to each one of us, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And as we grow in our response, and when we can finally say, I love you to the extent that I am dedicating my life to you, that I am going to open my heart to your grace, that I'm going to open my life to your mission, then Jesus sends us forth. That is a great act of forgiveness. Now, I am certain the reason that Peter and the six other disciples with him went fishing is because they did not understand what had happened. They did not understand that the power of God's grace had rolled away that stone in the tomb. 
They did not understand that the power of God's grace had caused Jesus to rise from the dead. And they did not understand that now the power of God's grace was going to reveal a new kingdom, a new way of relating to one another in the world. They couldn't understand that. All they knew is Jesus was dead, and they believed they had seen him after he rose. But now Jesus is telling them something else that they are called to a relationship with him that has a mission. And we are called to that same relationship. No matter how many times in our life we have through actions or words denied Jesus, no matter how many times in our life Jesus has not been a part of who we are, no matter how many times in our life we have failed to carry forward any kind of mission of God's kingdom, Jesus is saying to each one of you right now and to me, do you love me? Saying it again, do you love me? Saying it again, do you love me? And when we can finally answer, yes, Lord, I love you, then he will say to each of us, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep. That is what it means to live as people of the resurrection. <clears throat> Because the world is full of all kinds of crucifying events. Every time you see hatred triumph over love. Every time you see prejudice triumph over equity. Every time you see self-serving people and pride triumph over compassion and self-sacrifice. Those are what we call crucifying events. And if you are people of the resurrection, you are called to, to feed those lambs and take care of those sheep. That's the call Jesus is placing on your heart right now, the same way he placed it on, on Peter's heart, the man who had denied him. The same call he's placing on you right now. And I hope that all of us, myself included, can answer, Lord, I will feed your lambs and take care of your sheep because I love you in the truest sense of love. Amen. Amen. I, I love the reading from Acts today, and even though I didn't preach on it, I love the line in that reading that is so true, because it says that God's <coughs> grace was really a work. Isn't that something? God's grace is really at work, and God's grace is at work at this table. As we gather at this table, God's grace is at work in a very special way, because we experience the totality of God's love for humanity. From the very acts of creation, to the voices of the prophets, to the liberation of our brothers and sisters from Egypt, to a young woman named Mary, a man named Joseph, a manger in Bethlehem, an earthly journey of three years, a passion, a crucifixion, a resurrection, and now a mission. And so, please join me in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And, and also with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We, we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth, and so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and glorious resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery, slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On that night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread in his sacred hands, he gave thanks to you, Father Almighty. He broke the bread on that evening, he gave it to each of his disciples, as he will give it to each of you today, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. And each time you eat of this, do so in remembrance of me. 
And when the supper was over, he took the cup again, he gave you thanks and praise. He passed the cup to his disciples, including the one who would betray him, including all who would reject him, saying, take, drink from this, each one of you. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant that is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And each time you do this, do so in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ will come again. For of your Holy Spirit in us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with one another, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy, with your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And we now join together in the perfect prayer that our Lord and Savior gave us. As we say, our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. This is the body of Christ broken for us. This is the blood of Christ shed for us. The invitation has been given. All are welcome to come and to receive.
join me now in our closing prayer. Almighty God, what a wondrous thought. Your wisdom guides us in each moment of our lives, calling forth a new way of living together, born and sustained by love, opening our lives to the true meaning of faithful obedience. Through the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, renew us this day to live and to witness as your adopted sons and daughters. Lead us to proclaim with tireless joy the promise and the glorious reality of Easter morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Please join us in our closing hymn, To God Be the Glory, page 98, verses 1, 2, and 3, with an introduction. with us today on this, the uh, Easter season. And we always need to remember that in Easter season we are called to live and be the resurrection for all people. And thank you, Cheryl, for a wonderful job at Lucius, Don and Adam for the music. And again, thanks to each of you and those who will see this broadcast later. We pray that you'll join us in person at Salem. We're very easy to find and even easier to get to know. Two very quick reminders. Tomorrow, 5 o'clock, Phil's friends. Let's all be there. It's going to be a good time. Everyone remember the address? Yes, Ed. They want you there like 15 minutes early. Too, oh, okay. So. All right, so that would be four quarter couple, till. Four, a quarter till yeah. five. All right. All right, let's have a great Salem turnout for that. And then Tuesday at 1 o'clock for, uh, for the uh, committal service for Johanna and Carolyn right across the street at Salem Cemetery. And I, I think as a family, we should gather around for that, for that moment. All right, it is now my blessing to ask us each to remember God's many blessings. May the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, fill your hearts, offering you hope, offering you transformation, 
and offering you wisdom. May the love of God surround and protect you and embrace you as you go forward as mission, as, as messengers of the gospel. And may each step you take, each word you speak, each embrace you offer, each relationship you have, be done in full communion with God's Holy Spirit. Let us go in peace to live as Easter people. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And we can say that with confidence, for we are a people loved by God. May we live as a sign to the world of God's love. Now, I had asked Donna last week at our Easter services, we closed, a special music was the Easter version of Hallelujah. I think the words are so clear and so profound. I asked if we could do it again today. So please listen closely to the, to the message. Three days went by.